Welcome to Understanding Islam, the second series, Standing Before God. This week we're going to look at the formal prayer in Islam, Salah. We're told that when Prophet Muhammad went on his mysterious night journey, when he was taken from Mecca to Jerusalem and then ascended into the presence of God, one of the things that he was taught on that occasion was that Muslims were to pray five times each day, to regularly punctuate the day with prayer five times each day. He was actually taught the rubrics, the, the actions of prayer by the angel Gabriel. So this becomes the central backbone of prayer in Islam, the Salah. This is universal prayer. It's done in Arabic. It's the same all over the world. So any Muslim could visit any mosque anywhere in the world and there they would find the prayer being done in the same language and in the same way. So the universal Arabic nature of the prayer means that those Muslims who do not have Arabic as their mother tongue have to learn certain phrases of the prayers phonetically in Arabic. And they also will learn some verses of the Quran so that they can recite them in Arabic during their prayers. Of course, new converts are encouraged to come along and pray in congregation in the mosque so that the prayer leader actually recites the Quran for them. The prayers are timed around the passage of the sun. This means that everyone can see when the sun rises, when it's in the middle of the sky, when it sets and when it's dark. You don't need to be rich. You don't need to be rich enough to have a watch or be educated enough to read a watch. You don't need anyone to tell you when it's time for prayer. The relationship between God and the human being is direct. Every adult can work out the times of prayer. They are responsible nobody else. Now, mosques will publish a timetable because, especially in the kind of northern climates that we have in Europe, it's not always so easy to know the precise times of sunset and sunrise and so on. So mosques produce a timetable that guides people in prayers. They have to be done locally, of course, because as you move from one place to another, so the time of sunrise and sunset changes. Now, for each of these prayers, there is a window of opportunity. So it means that there's an allocated time during which prayers can be done. And the five times for prayer are, and I'll give you their Arabic name as well, Fajr, which is the prayer before sunrise in the morning. Then Zuhr, which is after the sun, the sun has passed the middle of the sky. Asr, in the late afternoon when the shadows lengthen. Maghreb, when the sun has set. And Isha, at night time. So five prayers timed according to the passage of the sun. Different schools of Islam have different rules about grouping these prayers together and about shortening them. So shortening them perhaps if you are traveling, grouping them together. For example, Shia Muslims habitually group these prayers together 
into three occasions of prayer. Other schools of Islam say one should only do this in particular exceptional circumstances. These prayers can be done individually or they can be done collectively. It is better to pray with others if possible. It doesn't have to be in a mosque. It could be in a workplace or in a family home. Now, if a mosque is going to have collective prayer, then it needs to publish a timetable to say, if you want to pray Fajr prayer on this day, be here at this time, because a collective prayer has to start at a certain time. These times for collective prayer are generally at the beginning of that window of opportunity when the prayer is allowable. In order to remind people when it's time for prayer, the traditional way of doing it is to make the call to prayer the Adhan. This is a call to prayer that was initiated by Prophet Muhammad himself, and it is the prayer that we often hear in Muslim societies, which is very lyrical, which uh, draws people's attention. You can read the actual structure and words of the Adhan from the article that accompanies this program, but we're just in shortly to say it begins, God is the greatest, God is the greatest, I bear witness that there is no God but God, I bear witness that Muhammad is the prophet of God, come to prayer, and so on. Now, this reminder serves as a reminder for people even if they do not respond to it. It's there in their consciousness, I should pray. And in that way, it is um, a call to a higher ideal, to a higher and noble thing in their lives. In Muslim societies, when there are mosques, there are minarets that go alongside them. Minarets are these tall towers that we associate with mosques from which the adhan is made. And it is called by a strong male voice, the muazin. If you are going to make the salah, the first thing that you need is a clean place. Clean really in two senses. First of all, in the sense of not having an unclean purpose. So one can't make the salah in the toilet, for example. But clean also in the sense of being swept out and being clean to pray. This means that you don't have to pray in a mosque. On one occasion, Prophet Muhammad said, the whole world is my mosque. So I can pray anywhere that is clean. Now we often associate prayer mats with Muslims at prayer. And this is a way of making an ordinary space, like somebody's office, a clean space where somebody can pray. So in the office people walk in and out with their street shoes, that's not clean. I roll out my prayer mat on top of the carpet in the office, it's now clean and I can pray there. Mosques are carpeted. So it's a good tip whenever you are in Muslim society, either at home or in a mosque, whenever you see a carpet, make to take your shoes off. This is why shoes are always taken off in the mosque, so that we keep the carpet clean and fit for people to pray on. Now, Sunni Muslims will prostrate directly onto this carpet itself. But in the Shia tradition, instead, people will prostrate using a turba. This is this small tablet of clay which is placed on the floor in such a position that when the forehead comes to rest, it rests upon the clay. This was a tradition that dates all the way back to the time of the Prophet himself, 
when it was very hot and the sand, the pebbles on which they were going to pray was burning hot, people would take a little portion of it, run it through their hands to cool it, blow on it, and then when it was cool enough, make a little mound of it, place it there on the floor, and then they could prostrate on it without burning their foreheads. These days, lots of these tarba are actually made from the earth or the clay that is to be found around Karbala, the place of the martyrdom of Imam Hussein. The next thing that you have to work out is the direction for prayer. Now, we know that when Muhammad was in Mecca, he used to pray whenever possible near the Kaaba, facing through the Kaaba in the direction of Jerusalem, because this was the city associated with all the earlier prophets. When he moved first to Medina, he then orientated his community toward Jerusalem, and that was the direction in which they pray. Now, the word in Arabic for direction is Qibla. And there was an occasion some 16 months into the time when the Muslim community was in Medina, when a verse was revealed that changed the Qibla. This verse told Muhammad that he was to orientate his community toward Mecca from this time onwards, and more precisely toward the Kaaba, this building associated with Abraham and Ishmael on a place associated with Adam and Eve. This was, from this time onwards, to be the Qibla for Muslims worldwide. Now, if a Muslim wants to find their Qibla, then these kind of Qibla compasses are available. And this one is actually on a keyring, so you could use this when traveling. So one simply takes this Qibla compass and you can work out from it, wherever you are on earth, in which direction is the Qibla. And then you mark it in a mosque, at home, in the office, you mark it in some way so that you know, aha, uh -huh, I need to face in that direction. Now you can see that by everyone facing toward the Qibla, we have one geographical point of union for all Muslims on earth today. It's like the hub at the center of the wheel and all the spokes push in and point towards that hub. So it is the earthly focus of prayer. But more than that, because the Qibla is not only the focus of prayer for today, but way back through all the centuries and way on into the future. And so by a Muslim turning toward the Qibla in prayer, they are associating themselves with not only all Muslims alive today, but with all the Muslims of previous generations and all those yet to come. Indeed, we have a tradition that there is also a Qibla in paradise and that people there will orientate themselves in the same way. So this binds the whole community together. And we're now speaking of this worldwide community as the Muslim Ummah, the worldwide community of Muslims. Whenever Muslims come together to pray, Islam hates chaos. If there are two Muslims, one must lead and one must follow. If there are more than two, one congregation, one leader, everybody follows the prayer leader in the movements. Now, this is true whether one's in a mosque or if one is at home. So one of the particular duties laid upon a Muslim mother is that she should establish the routine of prayer at home. You can imagine that if you're a small child growing up in a Muslim family, 
and you see your mother and your aunties and your older sisters and cousins who are coming together for prayer, you want to be part of it. And so in this way, the prayer routine of Salah is caught and passed on to the next generation. Now we have a clean place, but the next thing we need is a clean body. We need to be ritually clean for prayer. Now it may be that I've been outside working in a dirty place and I actually need to be physically clean as well, so I might need to go and take a shower before I am ready for prayer. But there are two forms of ritual purification in Islam. There's kusul, which is a complete bath in which one is washed from head to foot. And this is especially necessary, for example, after sexual activity or after a woman's periods. The other form of ritual cleansing is called wudu. And this is the normal washing that people will do before prayers each day. And what one does is that one washes the hands and the forearms, one washes the face, the mouth, the nose, the ears, and one washes the feet. Now you can see that these are the parts of the body that one most usually uses for sin. So as one is preparing for prayer, washing these parts of the body, one is recollecting and thinking, what have I said, what have I done, what have I looked at that I need to bring before God to seek for forgiveness? These are also the parts of the body that I use most for work. So what I'm doing is breaking off from my normal work for a while and I'm instead going to spend some time with God. Now this state of ritual purity or wudu can actually pass from one prayer to the other unless it's been broken. And it's broken by things like sleeping, going to the toilet, being sick, this kind of thing. Now, there are some places around the world where it's not uncommon not to have any water for wudu. God is merciful. God does not want you to use the water that you desperately need to drink in this situation to wash. And instead, there's what we call dry ablutions. When you strike your hands on some clean dust or sand or stone, and then you wipe them on the face and on the hands and forearms. And this again is this ritual preparation for prayer. The final preparation that one needs for prayer is one needs a pure intention. And one should declare this intention, not aloud, but between you and God. This is called Nia, intention. O oh God, I intend to pray the obligatory prayer of Fajr of Tu Raka, accept it from me with a pure and humble heart. Each of the times of Salah are made up of cycles of prayer called Raka. Once one knows the structure of one Raka, then one knows the structure of each one of these times of prayer. Certain prayers during the day are obligatory or fard. That means that it's obligatory for every Muslim man and woman over the age of puberty every day to perform these prayers. And there are different numbers of raka in each of these prayers. So the early morning prayer, fajr, has two raka. The middle of the day prayer, Zuhr has four. Asr has four. The sunset prayer when the sun has set in the evening is three raka. And then the final prayer, Isha, is four raka. So if we look at the structure of one raka, then we can just multiply that 
and we have the structure of Salah. The first element of the Rakah is that one stands before God with total concentration and total devotion to God, raises one's hands beside one's ears like this and says, Allahu Akbar, God is the greatest. Now this is casting off the world, but it's also focusing all my attention on God alone. This is followed by a period of time in Quran recitation, and people will stand and either recite for themselves or have recited for them by the one who is leading the prayers, verses from the Quran. First of all, the first chapter of the Quran, and then other verses as one chooses. After the Quran recitation, we go into a series of movements. The first movement is a profound bow from the waist. This is one's response to receiving the guidance of God in the Quran. One responds by bowing in this way. Then one stands erect for a period of time in silent prayer and then begins two prostrations. In the first prostration, one goes down and kneels and then goes forward into prostration so that the forehead and the palms of the two hands, the knees and the feet are all on the floor by God in an act of total humility and submission. And at this moment, one is repeating the prayer, All glory be to you, O Lord, the greatest. Then one sits back on one's heels for a moment and then go into the second prostration. And again, the same form of prostration. And in this time, the prayer is, All glory be to you, O Lord, the highest. Then one stands again and that is the end of one raka. Now each salah is made up of two, three, or four raka, and at the end of the prescribed number, one then remains sitting back on the heels, and there is a profession of faith, the shahada, a statement of a creed. Then blessings are invoked upon the Prophet Muhammad and upon his family, and upon Prophet Abraham and his family. This is then concluded with the exchange of the greeting of peace, Salam Alaikum. This is done in different ways in different communities. It's customary after this for the congregation to sit together in a period of dua, the informal prayers in which the congregation raise their minds to God and express their praise and devotion and ask for his forgiveness and healing. These five times of prayer during the day each take between five and ten minutes. So if we want to put them together in the course of the day, we can say that the total period devoting to Salah is perhaps 45 minutes in the course of a day. So not a very long time. And again, God is sensible. God is gracious in this respect. God does not want to burden us with things which would be impossible for us to achieve. So indeed, those who lead congregations of prayer are told, do not extend the prayer because the piety of those people who are praying behind you may not be the same as yours. They may have affairs of business to get on with. So prayers should be kept short and fairly snappy unless the congregation agrees that this prayer should be extended. And in some places around the world, the congregation agrees that as a form of spiritual devotion, they will recite lengthy periods of the Quran at each of their morning prayers, for example. Now we can see that with the movements in prayer, you have to think seriously about 
what do you do if you can't get down on the floor and prostrate and so on? And the answer is that you are to make the movements to the extent of your physical capacity. So if you can't get down on the floor to prostrate, then you stay sitting in a chair and you move the hands forward and prostrate in that way when it comes to prostration. If one is lying in bed and can't do that either, then one can simply move one's arm as a sign of prostration. Ultimately, even the movement of the eyelid with the correct intention is sufficient. So the prayers are not to be given up unless there are truly exceptional circumstances. They are obligatory for every Muslim. It was the Prophet's practice to pray additional prayers in addition to these obligatory ones. We use the term sunnah. It was his customary practice. It was his sunnah. And there are different traditions of how many sunnah prayers he prayed, how they were divided before and after the formal obligatory prayers, but it's quite common within different Muslim communities to find people observing some of these sunnah prayers. And they are just the same raka structure repeated again. Uh, but it was the Prophet's practice always to change position. So after the obligatory prayers, he would change from one place to another so that he was saying, this is obligatory, this is optional. Know the difference between them. The principal gathering of the week, the principal congregation, is on Friday. This is for what's called Friday prayer or Jummah. This is in the middle of the day on Friday, and it takes the place, it's at the same time, as the normal suha prayer. And on this occasion, people will try to congregate together. Now, for a Muslim man, it is a requirement, it is obligatory to congregate together for this Friday prayer, if at all possible. For a Muslim woman, she is invited to come, she has the right to come, she's encouraged to come, but she's not put under the same obligation because if she was, in traditional societies, women have a responsibility for children and for the elderly, they would be doubly burdened if they had to balance their responsibilities to children and elderly and at the same time get to the mosque for Juma prayer. Therefore, they come if they can, but if they cannot come, they pray the prayer at home and they receive the same blessing that they would receive if they had come to the mosque. Join me next week when we're going to explore the centrality of the mosque in the life of the Muslim community.